allow God to use you. And amen. Hey, this one is ready to go. You can use that one. Yeah. Amen. You need a food time? Okay. Let's start over here. Fine. Hello. Good morning. It's wonderful to be here with you, especially to be here together with my wife and with my wonderful colleague, uh, Dr. Gilbert. Uh, we are here this morning to worship the living God. And one of the most amazing and wonderful ways in which God reveals himself to us is through the Holy Spirit. Can I get more amens here in the room? <laughs> wonderful. And the Holy Spirit has inspired God's Word, the Bible. And the Christian Bible consists of the Old and the New Testaments. And I'm going to see whether I can also use this microphone. Hello? Okay. The, the reason is I sometimes want to use my hands. And I think if we can get this microphone to work, I can move a little bit more freely. Anyway. Ah, great. Wonderful. Very yeah. good. Thank you so much. That's great. And what I want to show you now is just uh, here in this beautiful Bible that I've bought on the occasion of my uh, ordination into the ministry many years ago and which I use daily. Uh, this beautiful Bible consists of the Old and the New Testaments. And I just want to show you here visually just how big the Old Testament is in our Christian Bible. So I'm going to turn to the end of the Old Testament, which is here on my left-hand side, your right-hand side. And then I will show you what is called the Apocrypha. These are books that were written be between the Old Testament writing and the New Testament writing. And the Ap Apocrypha are about this section here in my Bible. And then what is, remains in my Bible here on the right-hand side is the New Testament. Mm. And I just want you to see just visually just how big the Old Testament is in our Christian Bible. Yeah. Can you all see that? Where, yeah, yeah, where, yeah, where yeah, are the yeah. cameras? Yeah. I hope online you can also see it. Yeah. The Old Testament is by far the biggest part of our Christian Bible. Old Testament here on my left, New Testament here on my right-hand side. And so really, if you think about it, if size matters, <laughs> then the Old Testament is the big chunk of our Christian Bible. You could almost say, I sometimes say this jokingly, of course I don't really mean that, but I say this jokingly to my New Testament professor colleagues at the seminary, and I say to them, you guys, you are studying the appendix of the Christian Bible. <laughs> and then they say, oh, but the New Testament is so much more important than the Old Testament because the New Testament tells us about Jesus. And I say, you suffer from an overblown appendix. You have got spiritual appendicitis. <laughs> of course, we're just joking. Because it's not about, is the Old Testament better, is the New Testament better? But what I hope to achieve this morning is to help all of us to dip into that great river of God's blessings that is the Old Testament, the Christian Old Testament. And so the title of my sermon this morning is that this beautiful Word of God inspired by the Holy Spirit, this Old Testament is good news for you today. I want to inspire you to discover this beautiful book, the Old Testament, as your resource for a fulfilled and beautiful and happy life in a deep relationship with Jesus, your Savior. And as we begin to explore God's Word, and I'm going to take you through uh, a rapid fire of uh, mini-sermons 
on different beautiful parts of the Old Testament this morning because I want you to dip into, not just dip into that deep river of God's love that is expressed throughout the Old Testament, but I want you to jump into that river. I want you to swim with me. Can I just see how many of you can actually really physically swim? Just raise your hand if you can swim. Okay, that's great. Now, the good news for you is, uh, and those of you who cannot swim, and I see there's one or two or three here among us, even if you can't swim physically, you can swim in this beautiful river of God's love that is the Old Testament. But before we all together gain the courage to jump in, I would like us to pray and ask God through the Holy Spirit to speak to us this morning. So uh, bow your heads, close your hands, uh, close your eyes, uh, fold your hands, whatever you do when you pray. Open your eyes wide, whatever you want to do. And face the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And ask God through the Holy Spirit to touch you right now where you are, right here, right now. And to speak to you in a new and fresh way and to reveal something to you of God's love that you have not seen before. So let us pray. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we love you, we honor you, we praise and worship you. Those among us who are um, uh, inflicted with doubt at this moment in our lives, those of us who have been struggling with our faith, those of us who have not been able to reconcile some of the, the promises that seem to be there in the New Testament, and we cannot understand why we are here today suffering, why today so many across the world are suffering, whether it's from Hurricane uh, uh, Harvey or Irma or other natural catastrophes, whether it is from social injustice, from oppression, from social exploitation, from economic exploitation, from prejudice. Oh Lord, we want you to speak to us through your word and ways that empower us to live our lives well. Help us to gain a deeper understanding of your word, not only for today, for, but for the rest of our lives, that we will discover the Old Testament as a resource for our lives today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So this is the theme for this morning. The Old Testament is good news for you and for me today, for everyone in the world. And what we need to understand is that the Old Testament is not just something, I'm preaching this to you, you now have a new information, and then your life changes automatically. No. What we're doing today, this morning, is far, far more important than that. Because what we are hoping to do is, we are hoping to discover the Old Testament as a resource for the rest of our lives. So it's not just about today. It's about uh, gaining access to a very powerful gift from God to us that will accompany us through the rest of our lives. And it doesn't matter where we'll be, where we will be from now on, whether in the highs or the lows of life, whether we are in success or in failure, whether we are in love or in rejection, whether we are in situations of justice and righteousness or in situations of exploitation, enmity and oppression. We have God's word to sustain us to empower us, to enlighten us, and to guide us. That is why the sermon here this morning for you is that this book of the Old Testament is good news for you today and for the rest of your lives. Hallelujah! Okay. I'm now lowering the temperature a little bit because I want to give a little bit of an introduction to why 
so many today, I don't know how many are here, but worldwide I'm aware that in the Christian church, a lot of people prefer the New Testament to the Old Testament. Let's just put this to the test. I just want to see hands up here in the room, and if you are online, I can't see you, but please put your hand up as well. Uh, those of you who prefer the New Testament to the Old Testament, just f own up to it. Be honest. Okay, there's quite a few of us, but not as many as I feared, so that's wonderful good news. <laughs> but nonetheless... There are many people who think the Old Testament, although it's like three quarters of our Bible, is not as important to them and as helpful to them in their faith as the New Testament. And uh, there are many scholars, many academics, many professors of the Bible who think the same thing. Uh, in fact, about 250 years ago, a very famous German theologian called Martin Keller actually told us that apparently there is a nasty deep dip uh, between us and the Old Testament. There is, a, there is a ditch, and it's full of murky, nasty waters. There might even be some alligators, some gators. That, that's my fake uh, American accent for the moment. <laughs> And not only this, but for many people today, the Old Testament seems like a strange place to be. It is not just that there is a ditch there. For many, it feels like a deep and wide river. Can I just ask, what's the biggest river in the Americas? Is that Mississippi. What about the Amazon? Doesn't count. All right, okay, Mississippi, all right. So you know what I mean? So for some people, it's like it's the Mississippi that is between us and the Old Testament. Now, I want us to discover that it is not so. Although many people think in order for us today to understand the Old Testament, we somehow need to repackage the Old Testament. We need to make it more accessible. We need to bring it over from this uh, other side of the nasty ditch, bring it over to our present realities in wherever we are in the world today. I want to say that's the wrong way round. Rather, what I want to do this morning and what the Holy Spirit wants to do this morning, the Holy Spirit wants to take us and bring us across the ditch to the river that is the Old Testament. There's not a ditch or a river between us and the Old Testament. Rather, what I want us to discover is that the Old Testament is that mighty river, the Mississippi, the Nile, the Amazon, the biggest rivers of the world. It is, of course, a spiritual river. But this river is full of the blessings of the living God. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are mightily at work throughout the pages of the Old Testament. And so now I uh, want us to reread some of those mighty, amazing passages from the Old Testament together to discover just how powerful God's Word in the Old Testament is for us today. The first thing I want to say is that um, I want to go one step further. I want to say this, spiritually speaking, and I think this is a very powerful, important truth for us today. Spiritually speaking, the Old Testament is good news for you and for me today because the Old Testament, in God's providence, is the new New Testament for our age. What do I mean by that? It's of course not that the New Testament is not important anymore, but the Old Testament, I believe, uh, has the treasure of the gospel of Jesus for our age in a way that even the New Testament itself cannot have to the same degree. 
And I want to explain that to you now, and I better, I think I'm getting very excited now, so I want to move around a little bit. Um, what it is, is if you think about it, so first of all, the New Testament is about one quarter of our Bible. The Old Testament is about three quarters of the Bible. Secondly, the New Testament was written by people who either knew Jesus or knew somebody who knew Jesus. Like, for example, uh, Luke, who wrote uh, Luke's gospel. He knew Paul. Paul knew Jesus. And so the New Testament was written within one generation by people, many of whom heard Jesus say to them, some of those who are standing here with me today uh, will still be alive when I return to save the world. And so in those early days when they were writing the New Testament, they were expecting that Jesus would come back in their lifetime or at the very latest in the lifetime of their children. And so when they wrote the New Testament, what was the most important thing for them? It was not about social justice and saving the world and establishing righteousness here on earth. Because they all expected Jesus would come back Perhaps tomorrow, perhaps next week, next month, next year. But within the next decade or two, Jesus would come back and solve all our problems. Right. But that was 2,000 years ago. So what happened? I don't know what happened. Jesus, in his grace and mercy, has decided not to come back until today. He may come back, of course, tomorrow. Hallelujah. But in the meantime, in the meantime, my brother and my sister, my friend, in the meantime, we have the Old Testament. The Old Testament. Think who wrote it, how they wrote it. The Old Testament was written for a whole people. For the people of Israel, God's people in the time of the Old Testament. And now in the time of Jesus, God's people all over the world. And this Old Testament was written by a people who found their identity as the people and as the people of God in and through slavery through social and economic exploitation, through oppression, through injustice, through suffering, through pain, through murder, infanticide, killing little children to keep control of the people of God. The Old Testament was written not over one generation, it was written over a period of a thousand years by men and women of God who went through all the ups and downs of life, through all the triumphs of God's mercy and favor and blessings and salvation. But they also went through periods of pain, of even God-forsakenness. They went sometimes through decades in the exile in Babylon, through decades of feeling that God was not there for them anymore. And you know what? They wrote the Old Testament during those very times. Because in the longing of their hearts, in the sense of God forsakenness, their hearts stretched out to the living God and asked him, Oh Lord, where are you in my life today? In the suffering that I am going through right here, right now. And it has been going on for so long. And it's not just for me. It's my neighbor. It's my daughter. It's my brother. It's my parents. It's my friends. We are all of us suffering. What, O oh Lord, are you going to do about it? How long, O oh Lord? Why? 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 
And it is those very same words written in Psalms 22 that Jesus himself on the cross in the moment when he died for our sins spoke with his last breath. Why? Why, O oh Lord, have you forsaken me? And so that is why, and I'm breathless even with all. <laughs> that, is, that is why I want us to discover here this morning today that the Old Testament is good news for you and for me. Because it helps us understand how we can deal with the suffering, the pain, and the injustice of our age. It gives us the hope that we can hold on to God. It also gives us the honesty to be truly honest with God. We can even ask God, why, O oh Lord? And as we study the Psalms, they are full of lament, of painful expressions of suffering. And they are asking God questions. And you know, a friend of mine from the Philippines, he wrote an amazing book. And the book was a study of the Psalms. And in it, he asked, he, the title that he came up with for his book on the basis of studying the Psalms was this. He said, it's okay to be not okay as a Christian. And isn't that liberating? That we can be honest with ourselves, honest with our brothers and sisters in church, and honest with our God. It's okay not to be okay. It's okay to be honest and face the injustices and name the demons of any age and our age and to confront them in the power of God. And so when the Old Testament is the new New Testament for us today, then it has amazing things to say to us in all sorts of levels. It carries us through the pain of injustice, the pain of natural disasters, the pain of sickness. But it also gives us the hope that as we hold on to God, God will eventually show up. God will intervene on behalf of his people and on my behalf and on your behalf, God is faithful. God is faithful. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And not only that, the law. What about the law? We commonly think that the law is something for the Old Testament, for Israelites, for the Jewish believers of today, but not for Christians. Why is that? What do you think is that? To be honest, I think it's because as modern day Christians, we are so excited about grace and mercy, we get lazy. We get lazy. Because the Old Testament written over a thousand years by beautiful, wonderful, amazing teachers of the faith gave us the law not in order to enslave us, not in order to make us feel guilty, but in order to give us a standard to live for. A colleague of mine, a Professor Wenham uh, from the United Kingdom, he puts it beautifully. He says that in all societies, in all ages, when people make laws... This is true for secular laws, it's true for the American Constitution, it's true for common law in England, it's true for the German Constitution and so on. For all the laws we make, they, these laws, do not represent the ideals of the lawmakers, but the limits of their tolerance. What do I mean by that? Not the ideals of the lawmakers, but the limits of their tolerance. Laws can only work if they can be enforced, usually by the police and the judiciary and so on. 
And so in order to make sure that they can be enforced, you can't go for the ideal because the ideal is never, never has been enforceable. And so if we think about the law of the Old Testament, I don't mean every single individual law, and there are some that are not particularly relevant or important or binding for Christians today. But when we think about the law of the Old Testament, which goes into so many details, mostly, by the way, about social justice and protection of the vulnerable, the widow, the orphan, and the foreigner, the foreigner, he who has ears to hear, let him hear the foreigner. Come back to the foreigner, the Holy Spirit allows me. But if what we have in the Old Testament law is not God's ideal, but the limit of God's tolerance as Christians, to be honest. If I look in the mirror myself, if we think about the history of the church, we, we have aimed way too low. Yeah, yeah. Do you see what I mean, brother, yeah, yeah, sister? Yeah, yeah. We've aimed way too low. And when we then go from the Old Testament law to the poetry of the Old Testament. That's not law, that's poetry. That's art. That's wordsmithing. That is beautiful poems. Did you know we have love poetry in the, in the Old Testament? Love poetry? When we get to the poetry of the Old Testament, that's where we get the ideals of God and the Holy Spirit for His people. And I will just give you one snapshot here. I'm going to turn to uh, Proverbs, the book of Proverbs in chapter 25, verses, uh, Proverbs chapter uh, 25. Have you got it? Uh, Proverbs chapter 25, towards the end of the chapter. Verse 26, <clears throat> like, <clears throat> excuse, me. excuse me, verse 26, like a muddied spring or a polluted fountain are the righteous who give way before the wicked. Let me just read that again. You think, well, what's that? Well, okay, let's move on. But no, let's stay with that for a moment. Like a muddied spring or a polluted fountain are the righteous who give way before the wicked. <clears throat> now, it's easy to just read a proverb like this and move on to the next one. But let's unpack this a little bit. This is beautiful poetry. It was written by, if you like, word scientists. It was written by some of the great poets of their age. It was common among all the people. And it contains kernels of wisdom that come straight from the mouth and the heart of God. Like, what does it say? Like a muddied spring or a polluted fountain are the righteous who give way before the wicked. What is the purpose of a righteous person? Often in the Christian church, we've been taught it's all about not committing any sins. That's what makes you righteous. And believing in Jesus, that's what makes you righteous because you yourself cannot possibly be righteous. We all depend on God's grace. And there's nothing wrong with that. But this is now where the Old Testament becomes the new New Testament for us today because it complements this important truth that gives us the humility to recognize that we cannot be righteous before God in our own strength, but nonetheless, 
If we are followers of Jesus, disciples of Jesus, if we want to live according to God's ideals, and we can, then as Christians who want to be righteous, we are meant to be pure springs and unpolluted fountains. And how are we poor, sp pure springs and unpolluted fountains? What is the purpose of a, of a pure, of a clear, of a clean spring fountain? It is in order to be a source of life for others. Can I hear some amen in the house? As the righteous people in Jesus, we are meant to be sources and resources of life to others. We are supposed to be good news to others. But this proverb tells us the only way in which we can be clear springs, pure fountains of God's love to others, is if we do the opposite of what the proverb talks about. The proverb says, the righteous who give way before the wicked are a polluted fountain, a muddied spring. And so, isn't this amazing how God's word speaks to us today? So by implication, and here, we, this is written by the Holy Spirit, right? This is written by amazing poets. This is written with imagination, so we need to read it with imagination. And what this is telling us is, if we want to be truly righteous, if we truly want to be life-giving to others, we cannot give way before the wicked. Can I hear some amens in the house? If we want to be righteous in God's sight, we cannot give way before the wicked. We need to stand up to injustice. And it is the very word of God that tells us Christian righteousness is not only about getting to heaven. Christian righteousness is about giving life to others and standing up against social injustice and against the wicked in this world in every age, including our own. The Old Testament, my brother and sister, is the new New Testament. It is good news for you and for me today. It is an amazing challenge to the Christian church worldwide. We need to rediscover this book as God's word to us today. And we need to live it for the sake of others. You know, sometimes when I watch the news, I get, um, I get scared by the fact that often Christians are simply known by what they are against. So we are against this, we are against that, we are against the other and everything else. Shouldn't we not be known for what we are for? For the vulnerable and the weak, the widow, the orphan, the oppressed, and the foreigner. So, my brother and sister, I'm looking at the time, and I realize <laughs> we're getting close to the time. I wish I had another hour to share with you. But I want, what I want us to do now is uh, simply as I come to the closing in this sermon, I want us to look at uh, the book of Isaiah in chapter 55. And um, this is a, a powerful word. Um, again, the metaphor of water is very powerful here, um, expressing an invitation to you and to me and everybody online, wherever you are when you hear this. And it says this, Ho, everyone who thirsts, Come to the waters, and you that have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. And as I read this, I invite us as a church to come to God 
through a rediscovery of the Old Testament, reading God's word in fresh ways that helps us to live today as righteous people. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen, so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant. And I move forward to verse 6. And the invitation continues. And it says this, and this is a word for us today. Because this is good news for you today. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts let them return to the Lord that he may have mercy on them and to our God for he will abundantly pardon for my thoughts God says in order to to argue um, to support this appeal to us to seek the Lord while he may be found for my thoughts God says are not your thoughts nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For the heavens are higher than the earth. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And I want to call you now to the altar of God, where you are, here in this room or online or whatever. If you are one of those people and you have thought, I'm righteous because I believe in Jesus and all is well and I go to heaven. And you have neglected to stand up for the vulnerable and the poor. If you as an individual or we as a church, and not just this congregation here, but uh, the church worldwide, if we have not resisted the wicked but given way to the wicked... If, while thinking ourselves righteous, we have actually become a polluted fountain and a muddy spring. If we are in fact not righteous at all, because all our righteousness was focused on ourselves. If that is you, then God says to you, seek me. Come to me and receive my mercy and change your ways because you can do it. And if there's anybody here either in the room or online and you are wondering, you're wondering, am I good enough? Will God accept me? This is the beautiful word of God here to you. God says to you, if you feel unrighteous, if you feel unworthy, if you feel guilty, if you feel beyond the grace and mercy of God, this God says to you this morning, my ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts. If you think lowly of you, I, the living God, thinks, think highly of you. If you think you are lost, I know I have found you. If you think I am not worthy, I say to you, you are worthy the life and the pain of my son. My son Jesus died for you. And so here is the invitation for you this morning. Come and rededicate your life and not to be saved. I hope you are saved already. If you're not saved, then by all means come and be saved. But this is especially a call to the church of God, the people of God. If you have given way before the wicked in the past weeks or months or years or decades, now and here is your chance to become righteous with God again, to receive His forgiveness and receive power from the Holy Spirit to resist evil, to withstand the wicked, and to be for the vulnerable and the poor and the oppressed. So if the Holy Spirit is calling you here today, please come and receive God's mercy and power.